Hi everyone. Right at the beginning here, I just wanted to give you a bit of an update on the situation we have at the moment. As most of you would be aware already, immediately after our Easter mini-conference, quite a number of our group, our church members, attendees, and unfortunately also a number of those who came from interstate, we have contracted the COVID virus. And so the coronavirus epidemic reached our congregation as well, unfortunately. To date, as I'm recording this, we have just over 50 people that I know of who've tested positive for COVID. This includes already a handful of people who are secondary contacts. In other words, they're people who did not attend any of our meetings over Easter, but they have clearly caught the virus, most likely from one of their family members who did. So all in all, it's just over 50 now and our thoughts and prayers are obviously with everyone. To my knowledge, one person only uh, has been admitted to hospital at this point, and I understand is doing well. So we do well to continue to pray for the situation and uh, each one of us. Um, at the same time, I want to take, a, take the time to quickly remind ourselves of if we are getting symptomatic and do the home test, the rat test, we need to report the positive result uh, if we get a positive to the Queensland Health COVID website. And please do follow the instructions on the government website uh, on actions to follow. But just briefly summarising, those of us who've tested positive, we need to stay in home isolation for seven days. We do not need to keep repeating the test. But um, after seven days, as long as we are recovering, we are then free to go. However, for another week after the seven days, so another seven days, whilst we can go out and about, uh, we need to be wearing a mask uh, if we are in a indoor places like going shopping or wherever, or outside if we cannot maintain social distancing. Now, when it comes to the people who are living at home with us, who are asymptomatic, they will need to also stay in quarantine for seven days from the date of the last positive test in a household member. So in our case, my wife and I both tested positive day after each other. We need to be in isolation for our seven day period respectively. I get out one day before Mariana. Our daughter will need to be in uh, quarantine for seven days after her mum's uh, positive result, assuming she doesn't get any symptoms herself. Now, the household contacts who remain well, they should uh, have a first test done regardless um, when a positive results obtained from someone else in the family. And they do need to have another a negative test result um, on day six of their quarantine period. And for other further details, please refer to the Queensland Health website. Now, as you realised um, and hopefully got the information in time, this Sunday's meeting um, is held completely over the net. So we are pre-recording the messages and songs, etc. For the following week, coming week, um, the, the midweek meetings are cancelled. Um, and the meeting meetings on Sunday, the 1st of May, uh, are still a question mark. We haven't decided yet whether we will be able to hold them with some people in attendance or whether we'll pre-record them as well. So watch this space. We will try to keep you informed. And on which note, um, I have been trying to send some update emails to all of our members who have tested positive. And uh, I may not have everyone's email addresses. So if you do wish to receive um, and be on the loop, uh, please send uh, either myself or Yoni your email address. Uh, our emails are found on the back of the program um, uh, notes. So please let us know what your email address is and we can add you to the list. Um, obviously, um, we do have a church database, but some of the email addresses are incorrect. They may have a typo or quite a number are blank. So particularly if you are unwell, at the moment I'm sending updates to those who are, have tested positive or reported symptoms. Um, I wouldn't mind getting email addresses up to date uh, from others as well, if you are willing. Um, you know if you've received emails from me in the last couple of days, so that's all and good. Otherwise, I'd love to hear from you. And may this be an opportunity for us to update some of our contact details, which would be useful anyway. 
that's all for now and we'll keep you posted but let's pray our heavenly father we want to bring this COVID situation in the church uh, to your knowledge well you know that full well but we really want to ask and pray that you will touch and heal all of those who've uh, caught the virus lord and uh, help to keep them safe and well and particularly so that they do not get any complications or anything adverse would happen and father we really ask and pray that you would halt um, the, the spread of this epidemic amongst our church members and our friends and families and uh, this can be brought to a quick halt in jesus name we pray and ask for your protection and guidance for all of us thank you for being with us amen thank you very much may god bless you Hello everyone, welcome to Church Online for this week, hopefully just this week. I um, hope you're all doing okay. I hope that you're not too sick for those of you who are having any symptoms. So for those of you who don't, oh, who don't know, the reason for this being online is because of how many COVID cases um, we've picked up after the Easter conference. So just to be safe. And I think it's a wise and good decision. Gary has decided to, and along with the other elders, to hold off any meetings this Sunday. Um, and hopefully that'll give us enough time for those who are isolating um, to get better and for those who are um, yeah, at home waiting to see whether they have symptoms or not, just to give us some time and then we can all come back together the following Sunday. So this is my backyard, Logan and ours <laughs> backyard. <laughs> uh, I just don't know, I just thought it'd be nice. Or a bit of scenery for those of you who don't feel like 
and I don't feel like I can leave at the moment because we're isolating so at least it can be outside <laughs> um, but yeah I hope you guys are all doing okay and we are praying and we'll continue to pray for anyone who's um, sick who's got any symptoms and obviously praying for God's protection um, there's probably going to be a few cars every now and then <laughs> hopefully not hopefully it's nice and quiet a lot of it's nice and quiet um, but yeah, let's be praying, especially for our elderly family members and those who are more at risk. Um, would the Lord protect them as well, that they wouldn't get too sick from any of this. And yeah, we're going to do a few uh, worship songs, sing a few, three worship songs, I believe. Um, I think someone else was meant to be leading this meeting, but just to make it easier because all of us are sort of spread out obviously um and for filming and things like that Yoni's just asked that i lead and also do the songs and Gary will be sharing the message so that is our program for tonight's church service and yeah i hope that you guys are all tuning in and what i wanted to share about just to start off um this little um service i suppose is what i wanted to share about was spiritual gifts and what obviously the bible talks about is our um being one body in christ so one body but with many parts um so that's found in first corinthians if you guys want to join me with your bibles open up or on your phone open up um first corinthians chapter 12 but we will go from verse 12 to the end of the chapter this part is called one body many parts from verse 12 first Corinthians chapter 12 the body is a unit though it is made up of many parts and though all its parts are many they form one body so it is with Christ for we were all baptized by one spirit in one body whether Jews or Greeks slave or free Finnish or Australian or any other nationality whether whatever we are uh, and we were all given the one spirit to drink now the body is not made up of one part but of many if the foot should say because i'm not a hand i do not belong to the body it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body and if the ear should say because i'm not an eye i do not belong to the body it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body if the whole body were an eye where would the sense of hearing be if the whole body were an ear where would the sense of smell be but in fact god has arranged the parts in the body every one of them just as he wanted them to be if they were all one part where would the body be and as it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker and indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Love that. So that there should be no division in the body, that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets third teachers then workers of miracles also those having gifts of healing those able to help others those with gifts of administration and those speaking in different kinds of tongues are all apostles are all prophets are all teachers do all work miracles do all have gifts of healing do all speak in tongues do all interpret but eagerly desire the greater gifts and the next um, chapter 13 is that classic chapter we hear at every wedding um, when we're talking about love, but it's a beautiful chapter about how, I'll just read the verse um, two and three. If I have the gifts of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I possess, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. And that adds as well, obviously, to our picture of the body. So the reason I wanted to read that was just to remind us that we all have a part to play, every single one of us, um, whether we're on, you know, the 
brush it to you, or you're speaking, or you're leading, or you're on the tech desk, or you're someone who prays for people, or you're someone who um, prophesies, or someone who shares a word, um, all of these different things and more that we've just read, some things that um, we want to see more of in our church. Everyone has a role to play, everyone is a part of the body, everyone is important, and um, you should never feel like you aren't of use to God, you should never feel that you don't have a part to play. There's always something you can do for God, always something in some way you can give, and we're all called to serve. And I love that verse that it says um, that when one suffers, we all suffer together. And I think we've seen that in our church. Um, we go through trials together and we also rejoice with one another when there are praise reports, when God is faithful in different areas, we rejoice for each other and each other's joy. Um, and we're always, we, we function as a family, we function and we work best in that way when there's a need, we should all surround that person and, and um, that need should be met um, and we should all serve each other. The verse that I read today, um, also for verse of the day, for those of you who have the little Bible app as a verse of the day, um, and it was the verse that talks when Jesus uh, washed his disciples' feet and he says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash uh, each other's. I don't know if that's word for word, but essentially that's what he says, um, that you should now wash each other's feet. And that washing of the feet being like the role of essentially what a servant would have done. So saying that we are to serve each other. Um, and that's also what this one body, um, how that function is as well, is the fact that none of us see ourselves as better than someone else. We need to humble ourselves if we feel that or sense that we feel that and ask God to help us change that because of human nature, we, we can be like that. Um, and remember to, yeah, that we're all here to serve one another, um, because that does humble us. That reminds us that no one's better than us. Um, it doesn't put us down, but it's a humbleness that we serve each other, but then also lifts us up because we know that we will be served as well, not in return, but we just know that that's how the body functions, but we should always serve and serve out of love because if we have all those other amazing gifts and spiritual gifts and signs and wonders and faith that can move mountains none of that can be of use to god if you don't if you don't have love if you can't love your fellow even just your church members but let alone your enemies or the people um that you walk with in everyday life um you need to be able to have love to do all of these things out of love and to be of use to, to, in service to god so even though we're all not all of us, but a large group of us, including me and Logan, are currently stuck at home. Um, and it can seem like, what can we possibly do right now for each other? There's always something we can do. We are still the church. We still function as a church, whether we're meeting together or we're not. That doesn't change. We're the church 24-7, seven days a week, not just on a Sunday. Um, sorry, there's a fly there. <laughs> and um, think about and pray about what you can do. I just want to say it's been really encouraging and I want to thank the people. I've already had church people who have um, messaged me, asked how I'm doing, how I'm feeling and if there's anything that I, they can bring me for those people who aren't in isolation. So I want to thank you. You know who you are. Thank you for those offers. Um, and if that's a beautiful example of something you can do. But um, I've also been really encouraged that the young adults um, uh, have been suggesting that we do a video call uh, instead of our normal meeting, which is lovely, even though we can't um, meet together in person. It reminds me of that verse of never um, not um, giving up on meeting together uh, because it's so important. So for those of you, um, other people in the church, not the young adults, but <coughs> older people, <laughs> um, please be messaging, checking in on people, seeing how they are and um, making sure that everyone's needs are met, that there's no one who is in need that we don't know, we want to know and help, um, and be praying for everyone because we don't want anyone to get too sick um, and we want everyone to be protected and heal quickly so that we can all be together very soon as well. So I thought we'd just pray here, pray together, and um, sing some songs of worship and then after that, Kari will come and share a message for us. Mm. Pray with me. <laughs> Father, thank you that you are sovereign over all. And even when things are out of our control and when things don't go to plan, we can trust you. 
and that we can know that we are never in control and that we can leave every single detail of our lives in your hands. I thank you that you have your hands over our church and I pray for your protection over each and every member, Lord Jesus. I ask that those who have COVID, would you, Father, I'm praying that their symptoms um, would not get any worse and that, Father, you would heal them quickly. And I ask for your protection that there would be um, no further spread as well, that these cases would um, stop soon and not be growing. And I thank you that you would protect this community. And I ask that you would help all of us at home to be resting and um, not stressful, be able to help each other in any way possible. Would you show us how we can help each other, Father? I ask that you would yeah, be with every single person at home, wherever they may be right now, listening to this prayer. And would your Holy Spirit touch them? Would your Holy Spirit fill them with joy and peace and healing for those who are sick at the moment, Lord Jesus? I pray that we can worship together and still sing these songs to you and that that would lift up our spirits as well. And we pray that the message that Kari has for us would also speak to our hearts and that you would be taking care of us all up until we meet again. And we pray that it would be soon, that it would be the following Sunday. Bless this meeting, Lord. Bless every single person watching at home. And although I don't know their prayer requests, Lord, because I can't ask them right now, you know them, Father. And so I just ask for anyone who is feeling like there is a prayer or a burden on their heart, um, first of all, that you would remind them, Lord, that you know and you see, you know that prayer before those words are even spoken on their lips. Um, but also, Lord, I pray that they would know that they can reach out and ask for prayer from anyone in the church, Lord, that we are their family and that that is what we are meant to do for each other, Lord, to support each other and pray for each other. So I pray that there would be prayer requests sent out, Lord, and I pray that you would be already working in those things. Um, yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness and that you will protect us through this weird week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> um, I hope that you guys will be blessed by just singing some songs, even though it's not together. In spirit, we will be together and that you will enjoy um, Gary's message as well and receive something from that. So join me and Logan now in singing some songs and let's be praying that we can be together again soon and enjoy the message.
worshiping, worshiping together in spirit. <laughs> that was great. Thanks. <clears throat> and now, Lord, I lift your name on high.
hope that everyone is keeping safe and at home and I hope that no one's gotten too sick. Um, we know there's a lot of obviously COVID going around so we're just praying that everybody is safe and um, healthy and staying at home and um, doing all the right things. Yeah, take care of yourself everyone. We hope you're having a wonderful week even if you are stuck at home and we're looking forward to all seeing you once we're out and uh, everyone else is out as well. Have a lovely week guys. Well, good evening again. Uh, this is a bit unusual. Um, doing this message and whole meeting, in fact, um, totally by live stream again and or recording, whether you're watching this later on. As you heard in the coronavirus update, um, we've had to cancel the meeting, face-to-face uh, -face meeting, and um, had to resort to just doing the pre-recorded uh, songs and messages. So... What I want to do now, and uh, my particular prayer is that the Holy Spirit will still be present through this, even though this feels a bit challenging for me um, to be sharing like this, even though I've done it a little bit uh, in my previous uh, employment. But when I'm uh, trying to share from the Word of God to the congregation, it, it is a different sort of setting. However, as I was praying before, uh, sharing these messages, the thought occurred to me that, because um, we're looking at the Book of Acts, and the Holy Spirit uh, working in the book of Acts and what happens, that even when uh, the first Christians were imprisoned, they were praising God and uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit was there, giving them joy, etc. So uh, in the same way, even though we are facing some unusual technical circumstances, and even though a number of us are sick, the Holy Spirit is here. And surely the Holy Spirit can work through technology uh, and through other means, as he has done so much in the past. So let's be praying that the Holy Spirit's presence will be here um, as we look at um, the, the Word of God, uh, what it says about the Holy Spirit. So let's get on with it. Um, I'll start from the first chapter of Acts, and we. my plan is to go through the whole of Acts fairly quickly, taking a uh, uh, bits of scripture um, annotated where there is reference to the work of Holy Spirit um, directly, noting that there would be other um, uh, locations in Acts and in the, certainly in the life of the first church and the disciples that clearly the Holy Spirit would have been at work. But these are some of the obvious ones. So um, by way of reminder, we start from chapter 1 uh, before Jesus was uh, taken up to heaven, uh, his ascension after being raised from the dead. Uh, there's a reference uh, right at the beginning, as we read last time before uh, Easter, that uh, he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. And a bit later said that he um, commanded them, uh, saying that, as you've heard from me, John will bap baptize with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now and he told them then that it's not up to you to know the uh, times or epochs that the Lord has uh, the God has given but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses from Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth um, Jesus first commanded the disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father and then, then will be filled with power to be witnesses. A little bit later on um, in the first chapter, we also read um, about um, the choosing of uh, an, another witness or apostle to replace Judas Iscariot. And um, in uh, in that selection process, Peter refers to the Old Testament scriptures, noting that the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas. So clear acknowledgement right there and then that the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit was at work in the Old Testament and inspiring the writers of the Old Testament scriptures. So Holy Spirit is very much present there from the first page, first chapter um, of the book of Acts. Then when we come to chapter 2, um, of course, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and um, it says that suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind and it filled the whole house where they were staying, sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as of fire, 
distributing themselves and they rested on each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So this was um, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and also clearly mentions for the first time of the speaking in other tongues or other languages um, as, as part of being filled with the Holy Spirit. This is one of the three specific mentions in the book of Acts where the, the filling with the Holy Spirit is accompanied by speaking in tongues and we'll see the others a bit later on. Then uh, Peter responded to mockery of people around there wondering what this is all about. And he um, gave a lengthy sermon referring to the Old Testament scriptures and how they were fulfilled through Jesus. And he noted that what happened here today um, is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And um, quoting him, he said that it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men will see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even my, on my born slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And um, a bit further on he added um, that Jesus God, this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. And therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. So a strong testimony, Tad, uh, this is in continuation with God's working through the prophets, through the Old Testament story. And um, Jesus has now, as he promised, gone to heaven, has poured out the Holy Spirit in accordance with the scriptures. Um, quite a number of the Jews listening there were uh, furious and left, but also quite a significant number at least a good 3,000, um, were pierced to the heart, as the scriptures say, and were asking Peter, what shall we do? And he answered and um, said that, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. So those many far off includes us, just noting, and that's reassuring. And when we knew that, but it's still reassuring to get that confirmation from Scripture, that indeed the promises of God um, in the Old Testament are um, also for us. And Peter may not have realized at the time that it also included um, us Gentiles who are not Jews by birth, um, but... Um, in Jesus Christ, uh, the promises come to us as well, and we all form together the church of the living God. Then a little bit later, in chapter 4, a great miracle happened as uh, Peter and John were on their way to pray in the temple. Um, and uh, by the power of Jesus um, and faith in him, a lame beggar is healed. And um, then the disciples are brought before the Sanhedrin. The Jewish council uh, and they are questioned as to how they by what power were they doing this thing I think it's quite amazing how the people who've uh, chosen not to believe uh, in spite of many irrefutable proofs their callousness of their heart uh, just goes further and further and not seeing what's clearly before them they start questioning the disciples by what authority have you done this blah 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 not giving God the praise due to him because it was clearly by the power of Jesus Christ that, um, and by belief in his name uh, that the man was made well. And it actually does say in that context that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, replied to them. So there again, that the, uh, now that the Holy Spirit had come, Peter had become a bold witness, as indeed did other disciples. Now, after this chastising of the apostles, um, they all got together again, the believers, and um, we read that they were together lifting their voices in one accord and um, they prayed to God and uh, said that, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, drawing attention to God's magnificence. It's not that God needs reminding and, oh, yes, I did that. No, it is we need reminding. 
but also it's um, a common type of prayer, including in the Psalms, etc., referring to God's, wor- God's works of old. And then that also builds our faith in his ability to work today and do the same thing. So uh, you made all this who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father, David, your servant said, why do the Gentiles rage, etc. So again, by the by, a reference to Holy Spirit working through the Old Testament saints and prophets. And um, their prayer then comes to a, to a head in verse 29 of chapter 4, and the disciples spread that, and now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak the word of God with boldness. So that's a really comforting, encouraging passage. They poured out their heart to God, um, pleaded with God, you've made everything, uh, your power, this has all happened by your will, Now give us strength, give us boldness, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit again. Mind you, it was pretty impressive uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit when the whole place was shaken. Sometimes we might wish that, gee, it'd be nice for that to happen. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we are filled with the Holy Spirit again and again. And he gives us the boldness, the encouragement, and the strength that we need. In the next chapter, there's a warning uh, when Ananias and Sapphira tried to conspire to lie to the Holy Spirit about how much they have donated or not donated. That's uh, probably irrelevant. The fact is that they tried to conceal and lie to the Holy Spirit. And Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And um, you may recall the story, then both him and a little bit later on, a few hours later, his wife dropped dead on their feet. That was a warning to their new church that don't try to um, trick the Holy Spirit. It's not going to work. God is a holy God. The Holy Spirit is holy. And um, uh, we need to be aware of that. But then again, I emphasize If we have done something wrong, we don't need to be fearful. We can come in repentance to the foot of the cross, ask for the blood of Christ to cover our sins, which it does. And he's keen to forgive and um, to uplift us again. And he's keen to fill us with his Holy Spirit so we can have the power and the strength to go on day by day. Now, a little bit later um, in the same chapter, The apostles, uh, unnamed number, um, are again before the Jewish council. The day before they had been arrested for preaching again in the name of Christ and had been thrown in the temple and miraculously, the the door, uh, thrown in the jail uh, rather, and miraculously the, the gates of the jail were opened while the guards were fast asleep. And uh, they all walked out, and at daybreak, they were back in the temple preaching about Jesus. So they were brought back to um, to answer to the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, and as part of their um, part of their response, and again a bold testimony to Jesus. Um, I quote these words from verse 32, and um, they said, "We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him." So the Holy Spirit in us is a witness and bears witness and helps us to bear witness. Now, as we move on to um, chapter 6, there's a dispute on practical matters, uh, on relief supplies, uh, the daily distribution of food. And the apostles came up with um, a spiritual answer and suggested um, of selecting seven deacons to be helping with the practical issues. And those deacons, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And in particular, a reference is made to Stephen um, as man full of faith, and the list includes a number of others. And then soon after, Stephen is um, called to question by the Jewish leaders, and he gives a lengthy discourse in chapter 7 of Acts and um, refers to 
history of Israel, how God was working through the speaking through the prophets, um, but how their fathers were stiff-necked and didn't believe them, and said, "You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. Uh, you are doing just as your fathers did." And um, a bit later, at seven fifty-five. Um, it says about Stephen, but being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing in the right hand of God. And when he mentioned this, then that really um, enraged the Jews and they stoned him to death. And he became the first Christian martyr time for the testimony, his testimony of the Lord. Uh, but he was full of the Holy Spirit, so much so that he forgave his tormentors and asked for forgiveness for them and um, uh, gave his spirit and went to be with the Lord and uh, was um, received into glory. Interestingly, it says Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Uh, sometimes that's been referred to that um, and Jesus himself stood up because we know that he's sitting at the right hand of God. I'm not suggesting that he's always sitting down, but here he was standing up to receive the first witness to his name who died for bearing witness to Jesus. And Stephen went to be in glory with him and is rejoicing there and waiting for us. Now, after that, persecution broke out widely and um, many of the believers scattered. And Philip, uh, who's quite an amazing evangelist, he went to Samaria and preached the word there. So we start seeing an in interesting progression According to the words of Jesus before in 1.8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So now Philip went to Samaria preaching the gospel and many people were saved, um, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit. So the elders in uh, Jerusalem sent Peter and John to Samaria and when they prayed for the new believers, they received the Holy Spirit. And uh, Acts 8.17 then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, then an interesting thing happens. Um, a, a sorcerer by the name of Simon had also believed in Jesus. But then when he saw that um, the apostles had a gift of laying hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit, he asked for that. And um, saying that give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this may seem like a, or sound like, a, well, that's a great idea and good because God um, wants to give gifts to his people as we read much later on in the letters in the New Testament. But Simon's motives were wrong. Yeah, so Peter condemned him strongly and strongly asked him to uh, repent. Um, so nothing uh, worse happens to him. The, uh, the Bible never tells us whether, um, uh, whether he actually repented or not, but his motives were wrong. So a warning for us that, yes, we need to desire the gifts and um, may they flourish in our church and among our midst. But it is not for our glory or to be seen that I'm something special. I have some special power. No, it is for the benefit of the whole church, for the glory of God. Then later, um, uh, Philip um, is asked uh, by God to go down to the road leading to Gaza. And then um, the, the Spirit said to him, go up and join this chariot. He saw a man going in a chariot, and uh, he was the Ethiopian eunuch in the service of the, of the queen. And he was reading scriptures, and uh, then he invited Steve, uh, Philip to the, the chariot to explain what was written in the prophet Isaiah about Jesus. And then he was born again and baptized. But the point is, the Spirit was leading Philip. So he obeyed what the Spirit said him, sounded crazy, but he went and um, the message spread widely uh, from that. In uh, chapter 9, then we read about uh, Saul. He was traveling to Damascus, full of hatred for the believers, for Christians, and we wanted to go and arrest him in Damascus as well. But then he was uh, met by the Lord on the road, miraculously. And he was made blind and um, walked to the city uh, where he was praying and fasting for three days. And then um, in Damascus, um, God spoke to one of the disciples, Ananias, and asked him to go and pray 
for Paul because Paul uh, or Saul, uh, he, as he was known then, uh, because Saul was a chosen instrument for God. And Ananias, quite understandingly, understandably, initially was hesitant because I mean this man's come here to kill all of us. So, but God persuaded him to go, so he obeyed. And it said that so Ananias departed and entered the house where Saul was saying, staying. And after laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then um, it was as if scales fell off um, Saul's eyes. And um, he was baptized. Um, it, now, the Bible doesn't say exactly when and where Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. I think um, it's um, probably uh, a good chance that it happened exactly then, because that's what Ananias was saying, that you will retain your, regain your sight and um, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Much later in his letters, um, Paul refers to uh, praying in tongues much more than all of you. So we're not told when he first spoke in tongues, etc. So that's immaterial. But Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit when he was born again. And um, the rest is history, kind of as they say. And um, then it said um, a little bit later on that after that, the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. So here we see another function operating uh, of the Holy Spirit. It's comforting the church. And uh, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the word of God spread and increased. Now the next stage comes in uh, chapter 10 of Acts. Peter's initially given a vision uh, about clean and unclean animals, uh, and he, while he was puzzling about what it meant, um, the, the Spirit um, gave him instructions to go with the men who are knocking downstairs and go with them. And indeed, they led him to the house of Cornelius, who was a non-Jew, but a righteous one and was praying to God, and God wanted to take him further with this household. And then... Uh, in chapter 10, we read how Peter entered the household of Cornelius to see the house full of people. And then he started preaching to them about salvation in Jesus, how God had anointed him. And he said, for instance, in verse 38, You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And a bit later on it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And indeed that's what happened. Then they baptized happily these new Gentile Christians who were filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, the same as um, uh, the first group of disciples in Jerusalem uh, on the day of Pentecost. So the word of God spread and the Holy Spirit was with them and working through the Christians and filling people with the Holy Spirit and power. Peter was then, of course, called to question uh, by the church leaders in Jerusalem why he had done so. And he referred to say that when I heard them speak, uh, when I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just like he did um, um, on us in the beginning. And uh, that I remembered that Jesus said that John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So then the church leaders in Jerusalem became convinced as well that, wow, so God has also prepared the way of salvation for Gentiles also, which was a revelation for them. So I'm not belittling that. That was a huge step for their understanding. But the Holy Spirit was working and helping them to understand more, showing more of God's ways and how God wants to work through us. And um, we do well to remember that in these days, um, there is no segregation in the church. 
we all who have been born again are following Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are on our way to the same heaven and we can praise God together. Now, sometime after that, um, then um, as disciples were spreading out, mostly they were still speaking only to Jews, uh, but um, in Antioch, uh, Antioch of Pisidia on the coastline there, um, a number of Jews, um, a number of disciples started to speak to the Greek-speaking uh, people as well, and um, they were coming to Christ. And then the church decided to send Barnabas to the church at Antioch, and it said of Barnabas that he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. So Barnabas had a great influence, and I believe his name actually means son of encouragement. And in a few places of scripture where Barnabas pops up, he has that character of encouraging, including after this uh, event, he went to Tarsus to look for Saul, who was now or became known soon after as Paul, uh, and brought him to Antioch and they served the God together there. And um, while uh, talking about Antioch um, in 1128, we read about uh, an incident where some prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch as well, and one of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world, which did happen during the reign of Claudius, uh, the Caesar. Uh, so the prophetic um, the gifts were operating and uh, giving forewarning and preparation already then. In uh, Acts 13, we then read how um, the church were praying uh, and the Holy Spirit uh, spoke to them um, and said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them to do. And so they prayed and laid hands on them and they were being sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And the action hots up in Cyprus. Um, the governor or the proconsul of the island um, wanted to hear um, about Jesus and what the apostles were sharing, but there was a magician called Elymas who was opposing them. So Paul, um, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and told him, you who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you will not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord. Uh, and actually, uh, the magician became blind and went away. Uh, and then um, the proconsul also received Christ and was baptized. So this was um, outworking of the Holy Spirit as well through Paul um, and um, actions that happened from there. Uh, sometime later, uh, after the new church had started in uh, in uh, uh, Pisidian Antioch, um, Paul and Barnabas had been thrown out um, after that, uh, they had returned, actually, from their first journey. And um, Paul and Barnabas were thrown out of the city, but the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So in face of opposition, in face of struggles, it reminds me of what we are going through with the COVID situation in our church at the moment. We can still be filled with joy. Not we can't squeeze it from ourselves but the Holy Spirit can and will give us that joy and comfort and confidence to go on. Um, the Holy Spirit was also working through Peter and James um, when there was a council of the leaders in Jerusalem to look at a heretical question. And um, there's, um, Peter recounted how um, the Holy Spirit had been at work for him to go and spread the news of the gospel to um, Cornelius' house. And James noted at the end um, a decision and said that for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, etc., etc., and then gave the decision. So godly decisions were sealed by the Holy Spirit. And James was so confident, James, uh, the brother of Jesus, who had come to Christ after Jesus had died and became very quickly one of the leaders of the church, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. They knew they were living and praying in power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was working through them and was bearing witness to the decisions they made. So the Holy Spirit and us. Then uh, subsequently on the second missionary journey, 
when Paul and his companions were traveling around the modern day Turkey, a number of times um, the Holy Spirit forbade them uh, or the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them to go to a certain place. And then so they made their way to Troas. And in there, Paul saw the vision of a Macedonian man um, pleading with um, them to come over and help them. And uh, it said in uh, Acts 16.10, when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And that's what happened. And um, so we see the guidance of God, uh, with a specifically mentioning Holy Spirit, as was mentioned earlier in that passage. And uh, really, God has called. So the triune called has called them, directed, guided them to go to um, Europe. So this is actually how Europe first heard the gospel. And um, later on, um, in the third missionary journey, uh, I'm not focusing in all the details, in chapter 19, when uh, Paul traveled down to Ephesus, um, Apollos had been there before uh, and preached there, and he was a, a mighty teacher of the word, um, but he didn't know at that stage um, about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So the disciples, um, there were about 12 men that Paul was uh, speaking to in Ephesus, asked them, have you been baptized in the name of Jesus? Um, and um, no, they hadn't heard of that. So they had only been baptized with John's baptism uh, because Paul was asking, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they hadn't heard. Um, that's what they were saying rather. And uh, then uh, Paul baptized them in the name of Jesus. And when then it says that when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came to them and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. And there were about 12 men. So this is the third time that speaking in tongues is specifically mentioned after disciples being filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, then um, it says um, a bit later on that after all these things were finished, Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem and said, after that, I must go and see Rome. Um, so again, indicating how Paul was seeking guidance from the Holy Spirit and had the confirmation in the spirit um, uh, that he wanted to go this way and um, let me not go into more detail on that but we can certainly have that in this day and age as well we have the confidence where we know that the holy spirit witness where he is leading us now as paul was leaving um, from uh, asia on his way back to jerusalem he stopped over at miletus and uh, sent word to the elders of the church of ephesus uh, to meet him there, and um, he noted um, in his farewell address to the elders of Ephesus that the Holy Spirit is solemnly testifying to me in every city that bonds and afflictions await me. But then also he gave um, encouragement and, uh, and instruction to the elders, saying that be on, your, on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseas to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. So this is a reminder that um, God, through the Holy Spirit, chooses leadership for the church, elders, teachers, pastors. And we who have been called to be pastoring the church or being elders or shepherds of the church, which is a good term, as shepherds of the church, we have a Holy Spirit given responsibility for the church. Uh, we're not talking about it is not my church or someone else's church, it's God's church. And we have this solemn responsibility. And uh, I take this seriously, what Paul said to the Ephesian elders, and we rely on the Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead us into all truth and keep us from uh, falling or failing. Now, as Paul continued towards Jerusalem, then once he reached already the Palestinian shores, uh, after looking up the disciples, stayed with them seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. And in 2111, and coming to us, the prophet Agabus took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, this has been 
queried sometimes that, okay, uh, was there something wrong here or not quite right? Uh, Paul was getting repeated messages, supposedly from the Holy Spirit, that uh, not to go to Jerusalem or if he goes there, he'll be imprisoned or put in chains. So was Paul disobedient? He was just stubborn and didn't want to hear from the Holy Spirit. I don't think either is the case. I think both were correct. The prophets were uh, sent by God and spoke through the Holy Spirit to give a warning and or preparation beforehand. And Paul was in the will of God. He was traveling purposed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was guiding him. But at the same time, whilst he was on the correct road, correct path, the Holy Spirit was preparing him that, okay, you are going to face suffering. And Paul was ready for it, strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Now, in the very last chapter of um, Acts, in chapter 28, when Paul has already been imprisoned and taken to Rome, he didn't die in that first imprisonment. He was, um, we believe, set free again after that, even though Acts finishes there. And uh, while he was under house arrest in the uh, in Jerusalem, he called for uh, the Jewish leaders, so he wanted to explain the situation to them and then explain from the scriptures that Jesus is actually the promised Messiah. They wanted to hear him keenly, um, and some believed, but then others got upset and um, didn't agree. So I'll read one more passage, Acts 28, 25. And when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers and continued about um, not listening, not hearing what God wants to say. So in summary, uh, sorry, we've rushed through fairly quickly through the book of Acts. May this stir your heart and your mind um, to seek God's Holy Spirit and his guidance. Be filled with this Holy Spirit again. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit again. We saw in Acts, um, there's a lot more there, but in a brief summary, the promise of the Holy Spirit was given by the Father and also by Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit to be my witnesses. That was the purpose, to be his witnesses. Uh, in a number of occasions, um, there was a reference in Acts to the Old Testament scriptures <coughs> excuse me, as having been inspired through the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was already at work in the Old Testament scriptures. Um, now, when people come to Christ after repentance, the gift of the Holy Spirit is given. And not always straight away, um, at times later on when uh, they are being prayed for, and then they are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, is a confirmation, uh, in some occasions at least, of being born again. Well, we know that if someone is truly filled by the Holy Spirit, they must be a child of God. This was particularly so as a witness and a clear sign when the first pagans, uh, non-Jews, um, they came to Christ and were filled with the Holy Spirit. And three times we've noted uh, it has been mentioned that disciples were speaking in other tongues when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And I won't go further into that at this point. As a result of being filled with the Holy Spirit, the disciples were made bold, they gave strong testimony, they were also comforted by the Holy Spirit, and they were prophesying, and also other gifts of the Spirit were operating in the book of Acts. But again, I'm not highlighting those for at this point. The reference of uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit or full of the Holy Spirit occurs a number of times. And to me, that gives a really powerful testimony in under tough circumstances, being full of the Holy Spirit. Being full of the Holy Spirit, they spoke boldly, etc., etc. And we need that. In the face of persecution or opposition, believers paid, prayed for boldness and we were powerfully filled with the Holy Spirit again. We saw that the first deacons, particularly Stephen, were full of the Holy Spirit and acted um, under the control and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Also, we saw some uh, warning signs, the danger of trying to lie to the Holy Spirit. It won't work. Or also the condemnation for seeking um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit for the wrong motives. And again, that's not what God honors. We saw the Holy Spirit at work in appointing and sending God's servants. 
and uh, also in making decisions according to God's will, the Holy Spirit confirmed those. The Holy Spirit was also guiding and leading uh, believers as they went and stopping them from going in the wrong direction and nudging them to the right direction. Also, how last we saw the prophetic um, warning of um, the situations or preparation, whether it's preparation for imprisonment or persecution, preparation for famine, and indeed with the famine uh, we can read in Paul's letters that he did a lot of practical work to prepare famine relief and assistance. And so there was a purpose why the Holy Spirit was doing all this. So I hope through this uh, brief summary that stirs our desire to go back and read in your own Bibles, go through the book of Acts and make note of where it talks about the Holy Spirit and what happens when the Holy Spirit is poured out. And may God give us the desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit um, and to really have the strength and the comfort and peace with us each and every day as we walk along being witnesses to Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, your word, your Bible that teaches us your truth and keeps us from harm and from erring into things that we should not go and do. Lord, I ask for you to, through your Holy Spirit, to speak to us through the message we've read um, and the passages we've read from, from, your, from your book, Lord, uh, from your Bible, and uh, bring those uh, thoughts li- alive to you, Lord in spite of our weaknesses and failures and the, and the problems of the distance and being separated from one another at the moment. We thank you, Lord, that you are present with us through your Holy Spirit. You are not restricted in time or place, but you seek to be with us. Give us comfort and give us counsel and strengthen us from day to day. And thank you for adding to our number more of those who come to believe in your name. Be with our whole church and others who are joining us, Lord. This we, know, this we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Have a good week. Be blessed.